Okay, so uh, it's time, so we should get started. Um, good afternoon. My name is Minoru Ko. I'm from uh, uh, Department of Systems of Medicine. And uh, I thank you very much for uh, coming to the fourth lecture of a centennial lecture series at the Keio University School of Medicine. Uh, uh, we are uh, celebrating the 100 years of uh, history of uh, Keio University School of Medicine. And um, I've been talking about those for the other lectures, but so I will skip those and uh, directly get to uh, Dr. Slesinger's uh, career and uh, uh, just a, a little bit of introduction. Um, for this occasion, uh, it is really a great honor and a pleasure for all of us at the Keio University to have Dr. Slesinger as a guest speaker. And uh, he's been, uh, he has had remarkable career as a molecular biologist. And, uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, as you can see here, that the, he started his uh, research career as an undergraduate student at the University of uh, Chicago, and then went to Harvard University to be the first graduate student of Jim Watson's, um, the, as you know, the, who discovered DNA structure. And then after finishing his PhD, he moved on to uh, uh, Paris and uh, did the postdoc with uh, another great uh, historical scientist, uh, Jacques Monod, at the Pasteur Institute. Then he came back to the US and became an assistant professor at the Washington University, St. Louis. And then he was there and then, of course, the, um, uh, you know, rose to the uh, professorship, professor's position, been there for a long time, and has a long, uh, uh, fantastic uh, career there. But one of the notable uh, things that he has done at the WashU was the uh, creation of the first genome center. That's uh, the, basically the first genome center period. That he really started the sort of a model. Uh, everybody's using his center as a model for the genome center. So after his center, the, uh, there are many other uh, genome centers starts to appear. And NIH later on recognized it as a, as a genome center. So he actually created the system of uh, really doing a large scale systematic biology. Uh, then um, he then moved, uh, went to, uh, moved to the NIH and the National Institute on Aging NIA, National Institute, Institute of Health, NIH, in Baltimore. Um, so it was, uh, I think, the big uh, career move for him because he's been uh, university in academia for so long a time and went to NIH, in, uh, it's a US government uh, research institution. And, uh, but, and, and then I think it's been close to 20 years now at the NIH. And, uh, but uh, remarkably, he still continues and actively doing research and guiding uh, also many young uh, scientists and investigators. Um, so, um, yes. So, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on just, uh, you know, uh, myself uh, explaining what he has done. So, we will just uh, move to uh, his lecture. So today, again, as I said, that this is the fourth lecture of this lecture series. And today he's focusing on uh, and then talking about genetics and the rates of aging, quantifying loss of uh, reserve. Dr. Slesinger, please. Thank you, Minoru. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure and an honor to be here with you uh, at the centennial celebration of the remarkable record of uh, KO medical medicine. Um, and it seems appropriate uh, at the celebration of a hundred year record uh, to discuss aging. Um, we'll go into uh, several aspects, including five interrelated questions 
about aging. First of all, what is aging? This is a long uh, history of, uh, be, as a question. And the field has been dominated ever since 1952 by Peter Mutterwar's question. The question has been, is there a mechanism of aging that is independent of overt pathology? We all know that there are illnesses associated with old age. Is there an underlying mechanism that's independent of the symptoms and uh, problems of individual diseases? We'll talk about aging as a balance of forces that maintain robustness and forces that lead to frailty. And we'll talk in particular about the importance of the idea of reserve. The second question is, how can we measure aging? Of course, we know the chronological age of people. But is there a physiological measure that could be as good or better? Uh, what would be a marker? Uh, can we figure out a marker that's related to the cause or real nature of aging? Third, how much is human aging dependent on genetic variation so that it would be slower or faster, perhaps, in some individuals? Then, how do we think of aging compared to longevity or disease? Is there something that's different from disease and from how long you live that we can call aging? And finally, a question of great interest uh, to all of us, particularly as we get older, can we modify aging? So to begin with, here's an example. Here are my wife and I when we arrived in Paris for postdoctoral work in 1960. And here we are in Baltimore a couple of years ago. There are evident changes. Um, one of the most important is the quality of the wine. We can now afford wine much better than we got as students. But uh, the, the uh, critical point is that although there are many changes that you see, these are quite heterogeneous in different people. Uh, in fact, however, uh, a trained clinician when a patient walks into his office for the first time, can do pretty well at guessing their age. Again, sometimes the, the patient turns out to be younger or older than the guess. That's really what we're after uh, in this talk. So this is a practical view of aging, uh, that it comes about as the balance of two opposing trends. There are forces that tend to keep us healthy, robust, and it's often referred to as the health span. And it includes positive features of aging. Then there are the negative features, frailty and decline. Um, one way of defining these is by the uh, observation that the incidence of major diseases and comorbidities in general doubles with every 10 years of life. So what about positive changes? There are some things that improve with age. Um, not as well as in wine, but nevertheless, there are some things that improve. Some things do, some things don't. Here are some personality traits. Uh, modesty does not change. A person who's self-important uh, when they're young becomes a self-important old person. On the other hand, compliance, low aggression, the ability to get along with others uh, has been demonstrated in many studies, including these original ones at our institute, uh, to increase with age. Here's another example. Um, order. Messy people are messy throughout their lives. But deliberation improves quite markedly. So uh, as we say in English, look before you leap. There's much less impulsiveness, much more consideration of what might be the consequences of action before an action is taken in older people compared to younger. And as a result of these types of uh, personality effects, generally the balancing of points of view improves with age. So here's an example of 
probably the two most famous Supreme Court justices in the history of the United States, and both of them were doing their strongest work at the end of their careers. Perhaps the most remarkable positive uh, finding about aging has been that creative activity continues throughout life and it often increases with age. So for example, uh, Kurosawa had a 60-year career ending when he was 88 and it took his associates a number of years just to finish the great projects he had in course uh, at the time when he was lost. An example from the West, uh, Giuseppe Verdi, again a 60-year career ending in 80, uh, at age 88. Um, Verdi's last three operas, Aida, Don Carlo, and Falstaff, are considered his greatest by many of the uh, music authorities. Um, Aida, for example, premiered when Verdi was 81. On the other hand, we all know that there's a negative side to human existence. This is a Mayan representation um, in a museum in Monterrey, Mexico, where there's a vigorous man, the progressive debility with aging, and leading to the final sad conclusion. So there are forces that are promoting whoops, frailty. Frailty can be defined as the general decline of faculties and the less resilience, lesser resilience of individuals, individuals as we age. Um, in other words, in response to an insult, an accident, an illness, there is uh, much less capacity to come back and it takes longer. Here's a representation by our scientific director, Lu uh, Luigi Ferrucci, a uh, sort of fanciful version representing many of the processes uh, in our bodies, all of which have a homeostatic reserve and a mechanism for trying to preserve them. Nevertheless, in one system or another, there will be a progressive loss to the point where we begin to see real frailty. There will be a threshold at which uh, there is a clinical detection that there are problems, and then a threshold at which one reaches actual disability. So let's turn now to the questions we'd like to examine about this overall process where there are forces for, uh, that are positive and forces that are negative. First of all, this question of what is aging, the first question that we wanted to pose. And um, I'd like to suggest to you that the simple notion of reserve is a very useful one that we have a certain reserve capacity for any organ or cell type or system uh, and that it determines uh, as it's progressively lost when specific problems will come up with that particular system. If you accept that idea then because frailty and aging are resulting largely from the loss of the reserve if you could increase the size of the reserve, that could be, in a way, anti-aging for a cell type or organ. You could increase the size of reserve either by increasing the formation, the initial reserve, or moderating the loss. The system we've looked at most extensively is one that's very familiar to a number of you, uh, the example of menopause. So, this is the sharpest trait in female aging. It's the sharpest time trait in human aging generally. Uh, menopause occurs uh, at the age of roughly 50 plus or minus a year or two in all the cultures and all the historic era, historical eras about which we have information. And for uh, the fate of the uh, ovary, uh, ovarian function, the follicle dynamics determine menopause. It is the pool of follicles which are the ovarian reserve. They start at a very high level and they progressively then uh, decrease, especially after puberty when uh, at every menstrual cycle one or a few uh, follicles uh, is uh, either 
uh, progresses to ovulation or is lost. Finally, this is an exponential scale. When we drop to about 1,000 follicles uh, per ovary, uh, there's rapid uh, decline in, and uh, menopause. So the question is, um, by controlling the reserve, could we control the timing of menopause or, in effect, the aging of the ovary? Here's a classical representation of uh, what's happening now in human uh, reserve formation and utilization. Before birth, an enormous number of germ cells are formed on the order of 10 to the 7th. But most of these are discarded before birth. A fraction of them, roughly 10%, are enclosed in follicles. It used to be thought, incidentally, for a long time, that before birth, many of the follicles that form were also thrown away. Uh, recently, we've been able to show that actually it's only oocytes that are thrown away early. Anything that goes into a follicle lasts till birth. But after that, when the follicle pool is formed completely, um, it slowly begins to decline. Generally speaking, that will reach the normal age, age of menopause. But in some women, um, there's a problem either in the formation of the follicle reserve or in the rate of its utilization. And they have insufficient reserve to sustain a full reproductive lifespan and are found to have uh, premature uh, primary ovarian insufficiency, essentially premature uh, menopause at age 40 or below. Now, what we found progressively was that there are two master transcription factors, FOXL2 and FOXO3, which regulate the ovarian reserve and can be shown to influence the time of menopause. Uh, the first of these um, genes, FOXL2, uh, we originally discovered because it was the first gene in which mutations were shown to produce uh, primary ovarian insufficiency. So there was a group of women in whom we could identify this gene as broken. FOXL2 is the only gene that in the gonads is only expressed in the ovary. It's never present in the, uh, in the uh, testes. And FOXO3 is not expressed uh, in the follicles before birth, but has its mode of action after birth involved in the maintenance of the reserve. So a series of talented postdocs have done the work that I'm going to describe on these two systems. When we began to look at the uh, fate of the reserve in FOXL2 uh, defective animals, we turned to the mouse as a model. And here I've recalled to you uh, the general structure of a, a primordial follicle, the real reserve. The oocytes surrounded by the support granulosa cells, uh, stroma, vessels, uh, and then periodically uh, one or a few of these follicles will begin to grow until it reaches ovulation. FOXL2 turns out to be uh, critical for a number of processes, but in particular, uh, it's required for the formation of all follicles. Um, I should point out that in mice that are knockouts for FOXL2, uh, male mice are normal. It's the female mice, and they, they're equally fertile to FOXL2+, plus because FOXL2 has no role in the testis. But in the ovary, it's required for any formation of follicles. So here we're looking uh, in sections of mouse ovaries, uh, either just at birth or a week later. Just at birth, the knockout mouse looks pretty much like the wild type. Uh, there are the ovigerous cords. There are nests of oocytes that are there. And the black line is uh, a laminin, which is beginning to carve out individual oocytes into a follicle. And it looks pretty similar to what's going on in the knockout. But after a week in the mouse system, all follicles have formed. 
a few have even begun to grow, um, whereas in the uh, knockouts, absolutely no follicle forms. Piles up, uh, piles of laminin sometimes form. There's no single enclosed uh, oocyte. So the animals are com the female animals are completely sterile. So in looking at this first arm and it's, it's controlling menopause, if you think about the dosage of FOXL2 and its effects, uh, the knockout, which has no alleles, has no follicles. Uh, from the work in women, we already knew that the loss of one allele uh, has a loss of function. It makes follicles but they're too few for a full reproductive lifespan, so you have early menopause. With two alleles, you have the full complement of follicles, the normal reproductive lifespan. So the question we asked was, what would happen if you put in a third allele, a transgene? Would you get more follicles? What would happen to reproduction? And the answer is quite clear. Um, these are experiments in which the transgenic mice are compared to wild type, uh, and there's morphometry done throughout the ovary. And one finds that there are about 40% more follicles with the transgene than there are with the wild type. The rate at which these are then used up during the lifespan of the mouse is comparable because FOXL2 doesn't determine the rate of recruitment of follicles. But at any stage, because you started out with more, you still have more left. And so finally, at a year when almost nothing is left in the wild type, there is still an appreciable number in the uh, transgenic. Uh, I won't show you the data. There's actually more fertility. It's even more marked in the other system. So we'll look at that in more detail. And that's the second arm of regulation, the follicle maturation. Uh, how is the follicle pool maintained, this amazing capacity of our species to hold uh, follicles in the dictate state for 40 years or more and then activate individual ones? To retain follicles in the quiescent state, uh, it's FOXO3 that's implicated as an important part of the mechanism. This is a discovery that was made by the lab of Diego Castrillon. These are his data. Um, here's the wild type with the primordial follicles. Periodically, you see some of them growing. Um, and that continues for a number of months uh, to show progressive uh, uh, maturation of a number of follicles. Instead, when FOXO3 is lost, all of the follicles derepress they all become uh, large and are lost. And within a matter of weeks, the ovary is absolutely empty and sterile. There's nothing left but the fibrosis. It turns out that FOXO3 itself is regulated. And it's regulated by phosphorylation. Um, unphosphorylated FOXO3 is in the nucleus of the oocyte and holding the follicles in check. So only a few can be activated at a time. When the FOXO3 is uh, um, phosphorylated, it moves into the cytoplasm where it's inactive and the follicle can begin to grow. So here you have um, uh, the use of an antibody which recognizes phosphorylated FOXO3. And you can see that um, you don't see any phosphorylated FOXO3 at first, but if the follicle itself becomes, if the FOXO3 becomes phosphorylated, it obviously moves to the cytoplasm. Now, we attempted to regulate this by making a transgene in this case that was modified so all the sites for phosphorylation had been mutated uh, to alanine so that you could no longer have serine phosphorylation. Um, that form of the gene is not as active as the wild type, but it does pretty well. And what we saw was quite marked. At the top, we're looking at the gonadotropin levels during aging of the mice. So if you look at LH, the luteinizing hormone, um, looking across the uh, estrous cycle um, at different times during the lifespan, 
Uh, at three months in the wild type, the levels are quite low. Uh, at nine months, um, it, they're appreciably higher. But in the transgenic mouse, there's almost no change from the uh, three-month level in the wild type. And a comparable, uh, though lesser, uh, effect on FSH as well. Um, it's even more striking when you look at cross-sections of the ovaries. By nine months, and certainly at 12 months, nothing is happening in the wild type. It's essentially the, the closest thing to menopause in a, in a mouse. Uh, instead, in the transgenic, you're still having active uh, ovulation. And in fact, um, it's impressive, I think, that the transgenic mice show about 40% greater fertility. So at any point uh, along their lifespan, they're making more pups, and they continue that uh, at a time when everything is leveled off in the wild type. And this has led to some speculation about maybe hunting for agonists for FOXO3 as a way to extend fertility. But the message is clear um, that the reserve is critical and that you can, if you can either increase the size of the reserve or slow down the rate of utilization, you will change the time at which uh, reproduction stops. Oops. Now, this notion of that the reserves are so important, we've started to look at some other cases. For example, the kidney. Um, of course, for internal organs, it's quite hard to look at people. Uh, the resolving power is less. There is no technique that lets you uh, count follicles or, in the case of the kidney, count nephrons. But what we've used in the recent work is ultrasound. And we simply measured the length, the volume, and the parenchymal volume in each kidney for several thousand people on a variety of ages uh, in the Sardinia population cohort. Some of you may have been here for the first lecture in which I talked about this cohort in detail. Uh, just to recall for uh, those of you, uh, it's the study of about um, 8,000 people in a cluster of villages in Sardinia where genetics is relatively easier than in other places. Uh, this gentleman was 102 years old. He's the emblem of the project uh, at the time of his photograph. And the motto of the project is your genetic endowment, a treasure you can share. Uh, in these people, this is a, a snapshot of some data, a data summary. In this panel, the third one down, we're looking at the absolute um, kidney function, the kidney clearance, GFR, in females in red and in males in uh, blue. And you can see that after an initial slow period, there's certainly progressive decline. If instead we look at the volume by ultrasound, it looks rather different, especially in males females look very much the same in parallel to the curve for the kidney function. Males instead show a sharp hypertrophy, and then it begins to level off and starts to parallel the female. Uh, the same thing is true for the other measures and the ultrasound. Um, the I should point out that in every system that we've looked at, there are differences between the sexes. There are sex differences in the aging of every organ and tissue that's been examined. But um, the work thus far, where you combine these curves with the uh, an analysis of further kidneys that can be looked at from uh, autopsy or other materials, uh, kidney donors and so on, shows that what's happening is a progressive decline of nephrons. So now it's not follicles, it's nephrons. The end result is the same, a decline in function, uh, which can lead finally to a serious condition. In the males particularly, uh, when you have this hypertrophy, you have a decrease in podocyte density and more sclerosis. But the overall process uh, remains the same. And there's some discussion of whether you might have something like a um, reserve volume that might be useful clinically. That's uh, an open question at present. So just to review these results, the males show early hypertrophy, followed by a phase of decline similar to females, 
The reserve correlates with the number of nephrons and with volume, especially after age 50. Um, and this renal volume reserve may turn out to be a useful concept. Um, again, extending this notion of reserve, uh, in the ovary we have follicles, the kidney nephrons, and hemopoietic stem cells uh, for the lymphoid lineage, they're exhausted. Uh, you can see an equivalent type of process in general for many, many systems a more or less fast depletion of reserve. Nevertheless, the rate at which this occurs is not the same in everyone because there are genetic factors. Of course, there are also epidemiological factors, but in particular, there are genetic factors which, again, like for frailty and health span, can be pro or anti-risk. And there are DNA variants for every trait and every system. We'll come back to that uh, somewhat later. So this notion of reserve helps us at least to functionally define what we mean by aging. Uh, but how could we measure aging? There's been a long search for biomarkers, something in the serum that would parallel aging. Um, and there are many age-related changes that occur across tissues. Uh, th each of these has a, a theory of aging associated with it. And when you hear advocates of these individual theories of aging, they're all convincing. But it's not clear whether any of them is true. So for, for example, telomeres become shorter as cells divide repeatedly. Uh, and that's been thought of as a possible driving force. DNA damage accumulates. Mitochondrial energy declines. Uh, sirtuin function is dysregulated. And you could add to this. There's a whole list of things that are more or less occurring during aging. But they occur differentially in different people, and we don't know which of them might be critical. Here's a sample trait, a typical trait, which is the, the progressive rise on average of uh, levels of IL-6 with age. This is part of what's now called immunosenescence or inflammaging many, many markers. There's mild inflammation, which is an accompaniment of aging. This uh, puzzle about what might be a good marker um, has persisted in the field for at least 50 years. And the question is, if we could find markers, could we find out about specific genetic effects on aging the way we find out about genetic effects on lipids, for example? So can we find a marker that tracks aging as well or better than a person's age? If some people are aging slowly, can we quantify that? Uh, better yet, can we find one that's really involved in the mechanism? So we'd like a measure of overall rate of aging rather than specific risk in a particular organ. This field has been transformed uh, by uh, particularly the work of Stephen Horvath, uh, with new, better correlated markers. I'll show you two examples. First, the work of Horvath, who works with a composite methylation index. And this is from his paper. I characterize 353 CPG sites that together form an aging clock in terms of chromatin states. I propose that DNA methylation age measures the cumulative effect of an epigenetic maintenance system. So um, if we look at some actual data, uh, this is in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging at, the, at our institute, which has been ongoing since the 60s. And you ask for the methylation in white cells, for example, uh, the methylation level by, the, by Horvath's method. You find quite a tight correlation um, the correlation here is stated as R, which is 0.92. If it was R squared, it would still be 0.8, which is very strong. So there really is a way to measure a rate of aging. Most people are falling on the line of their chronological age, but some of them are aging faster or slower by this criterion. This is a, a diagram that Horvath uses, and there are aging clocks which are of different size on each organ, including a substantial one for the gonads. The, the 
his notion is that when he looks at this methylation clock, the methylation rate seems to be different for different tissues. So if we look at what is seen with methylation correlated aging, it has advantages because it's highly correlated with the apparent age so-called of a cell type. And it does lend itself well to genetic analyses because you have a precise number for each person. Uh, there are disadvantages, it's hard to do, it's very expensive to run this kind of test. And because it differs for various cells and tissues, if you go back to the original question of whether there's an underlying mechanism, um, if there is an underlying mechanism, a general aging process, it must have tissue-specific effects that are superimposed. You're looking at a kind of composite. It's also obviously distal to the mechanism of aging and not causal. Clearly, something is causing methylation. Methylation is not itself the mechanism of aging. Nevertheless, this is a useful, uh, a very useful marker, the best we had. What about a measure of aging per se? And we go back to the original question. Is there an intrinsic mechanism of aging that's independent of any overt pathology or particular cell type change? Uh, we assumed that there was such a mechanism and that it would affect traits generally. And so we asked whether we could define a quantitative rate of aging and ultimately genetic factors for each person. That is, are there really individual overall aging rates? Uh, this is work in our group by Ilya Goldberg and John Ding. And the notion here is that aging should affect a wide variety of traits or phenotypes as we age. And every person would have a personal rate of aging across hundreds of traits. And we began to look at this in the Sardinian project. Uh, this project has proceeded as uh, an example of the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning. And it uses machine learning to predict the effective age of individuals on the basis of their trait values. Um, I'll go over the principle um, and then show you exactly what we do. The notion is that you want to train a computer to predict the effective age of individuals based on physiological data and serum levels of proteins, all kinds of features. Uh, this kind of supervised machine learning, uh, you have, for example, a classifier that's trained on the data with chronological age as the target variable. So what you do is you have a group of people. You split them into a training set, and you see what the uh, characteristic value is for people that chronological age uh, in that group. And then you have a test set, another group of people who are different, and you ask what age they have if they're chronologically in the same group. Um, this is the way that this kind of work is done. You split into tra training and testing sub samples. You normalize the training and test sets. You try to reduce the number of traits you're looking at. And after you train the classifier, you classify the test set. And then you uh, get rid of the, all this and repeat it with different groups of randomly selected training and testing sets. So this was the Sardinia population uh, distribution of ages that we started. And we had quite numerous people up at least age 80 and split them up into five-year periods chronologically. Then we had training sets of randomly selected 100 individuals, uh, ran the classifier to get the uh, appropriate values for what was characteristic of that age, and then tested 11 other people. Then we started all over again and selected another 100 people randomly from the total group of that age and repeated this until the values converged. Incidentally, these techniques are all uh, standard in Python. For those of you who haven't encountered this and want to know about it, the Python sites have very good tutorials. So when we did this, we got a predict prediction accuracy, which you'll see is quite good. 
and it depends on the data rather than the artificial intelligence methods. So there are, there are different algorithms that are used in this. Um, K neighbors and random forest, they all give exactly the same result. And in this slide, I'm showing you how many samples we used in each training set for a five-year period. Um, and roughly 40 would be enough. We actually used 100, so we overtrain in order to be sure of the result. And it's the same for different algorithms. This is for one uh, age, one uh, date at which all the people were sampled. And this is a second wave in which we reran all the individuals again. In this case, again, predicting the age turns out to have most people exactly lying on their chronological age line. Uh, the R squared in this case is very high, uh, over 0.85, so the R is essentially complete. Nevertheless, there are people who are aging faster than their age cohorts and people aging slower. So this provides a quantitative measure. It's very important that no trait dominates. The contribution of each trait to this is very small. It's cumulatively that you get the re result. And in fact, we extended this to use completely different sets of traits. And if we look at the predicted age with um, rare traits, which are something we're only doing in this uh, cohort or might be done in a few population studies, and we compare it to a set of traits which would be commonly done at a hospital visit, at a medical visit, the correlation is very high. So it's um, something which ex is exercised across a range of traits. Now, based on this, we've used the AI to generate a composite age score. We can define an effective rate of aging. This is very simple. We take the composite age score and we divide it by the individual's chronological age. So it could be less than the chronological age, equal to it, or uh, greater. If we then ask for individuals, how well do individual traits score compared to the age rates? How well are they correlated? Uh, we had about 100 traits to start with. More than half of them give very significant correlations. Uh, some of them, like some of the cardiovascular traits and even a couple of um, personality traits are quite tightly correlated. So um, peak systolic velocity of blood uh, turns out to correlate very well with the effective rate of aging. But again, this is not effect size. The, the effect size is small for any trait, and you're getting a reliable value by looking across many of them. Um, Here's the distribution of aging rates in two populations. Here we have it in Sardinia. Here we have it in a mainland population in Chianti. It's also a study sponsored by our institute. And the, the distributions look about the same. Of course, they're clustered around one, but you have some people uh, higher or lower in aging rate. Um, most important uh, was a recent experiment in which for uh, the one population in the Italian mainland, we had both DNA methylation and traits. So we could compare what's seen with the Horvath methylation marker with which we see which traits. Um, and the correlation is pretty good. An R of 0.5, we didn't expect to see uh, necessarily a tight correlation because, again, the methylation trait is dependent on the tissue, whereas we're looking at something across many tissues and traits. Um, this is very encouraging. It means that you may be getting to something which is meaningful and, and could even be useful. So the reliability of these aging rate estimates, it's still early times. But individual traits can correlate more or less strongly with physiological age, effective rate of aging, but with small effect size. Nevertheless, you get a composite score that's pretty stable. DNA methylation in Horvath's extension of his work has been shown to be a predictor of all-cause mortality. 
And the fact that there's a correlation between our data and the DNA methylation data actually tends to strengthen both of the uh, markers that are being used. So looking at the aging rate from the trait values, again, we can think about advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's an advantage that different sets of traits give the same value. Um, and it's easy to measure from data at a standard medical visit. So that, again, it's early times, but it's conceivable that this could be used to verify that changes in a person's lifestyle have changed their rate of aging. So you might be able to have a useful measure. The disadvantage, the major one, is that we still don't know what's causal. Uh, in fact, uh, the, whoops, the mechanism of uh, aging Somehow that's not showing. The mechanism of aging remains unknown. Uh, and I've sometimes thought it's something like the, the uh, dark matter of biology. Uh, you only see it by its effects. You don't know what's actually happening. Now, the next question that we wanted to ask that we've now arrived at was, how much is human aging affected by genetic variation? Um, and now that we have this estimate of effective rate of aging, we can begin to see whether that responds to genetics. The basic experiment is quite simple, and it's to ask whether the effective rate of aging is inherited. In the Sardinia project, we have the people organized according to their families. Having family structures means that you can determine what fraction of the values of a trait are responding to genetics and what fraction is epidemiological. And the finding is unequivocal that the effective rate of aging is something between 40 and 45 percent heritable. Um, this means that, uh, that there's a change in the way we've tended often to think about aging. I had thought that aging begins about age 50. Instead, the young people in a family have an aging rate at their age which has a component resembling what's happening in their parents and their grandparents. The rate of aging is partially inherited, and it begins at a quite young age. Um, based on this, there are GWAS studies that are in progress, and they're too premature to talk about, but they become feasible uh, with this type of analysis. We had two other questions that I'd like to deal with uh, uh, quickly. One is, how does aging relate to longevity or severe disease? And there's been a tendency to conflate them. For example, in Sardinia, where people are long-lived, we're constantly having reporters ask about the genetics of longevity um, rather than thinking about aging. Um, there are differences between them. First of all, the heritability is, is, diff is uh, much greater for the rate of aging than it is for longevity. And, in the best case, uh, it's about 30%. A more typical figure is that 20% of longevity is uh, genetic. So yes, you find families in which there's a tendency toward old age, but it's not much of a tendency. Um, also, why would you expect these to be so closely tied when death has so many different causes? It's not only heart attack. It can be a fall that leads to hip breakage. We're told by experts that 90% of cancer is random. Uh, of course, that would affect things independently of any underlying process. Uh, there could be a flu epidemic, a car accident. So it's not surprising that the, uh, the course of the aging process is not identical to longevity. Aging rate is more likely determining the health span, how long you can go without serious consequences and if you go back to the discussion of reserves, if you consider aging itself, uh, it will become illness. For example, when we looked at the renal function in centenarians in Sardinia, the curve continued to follow the decline that we had seen in younger people. Older people are like us. They've just lasted longer. If you wait long enough and people lived long enough, they would all go into end-stage renal failure.
The reason why some of them go into it earlier is that there are genetic effects that cause uh, earlier promotion, earlier risk of the renal disease. So disease is superimposed on an underlying risk factor from aging. And the loss of reserve is the reason why aging is the major risk factor for these adult diseases. Now, we have a rate of aging. Could we alter or remedy the rate? And just briefly, there are three ways. Let's see if this is better. Uh, we all know the first, and that's epidemiological change. There may be 45% of aging that's genetic, but that means most of it is still influenced by epidemiology. Uh, we all know what to do. It's caloric restriction and exercise and uh, the things that we're constantly told to do. Unfortunately, it's much easier to prescribe those than to have them followed. Uh, people would like to have a pill that would substitute, and perhaps we'll get there. Um, the second would be by increasing reserve, and that's conceivable. You might be able to activate uh, formation of a greater reserve or moderating decline in various ways. And that's, of course, the basis of many therapeutic regimens. Um, the third way oops, is the famous regenerative medicine, the induced cell paradigm that is uh, so active now. And I've borrowed from Minoru, whoops, hmm, where am I? One of his slides which has, shows the classic version in which patients yield somatic cells, IPS cells, and the desired cells that are needed to replace the exhausted ones are made and then provided to the patients. Um, this is, of course, uh, only at the beginning of being possible. I want to emphasize that the aging fields is itself old, and this is not a new idea. Uh, here's a version from the 14th century uh, in a big wall mural uh, at a castle in northern Italy, which is now, incidentally, open to the public. Um, and it's the vision of the Fountain of Youth. Here we have the exhausted king and his exhausted horse and a lot of other people in sad shape climbing into the Fountain of Youth where there's a good deal of activity that we should not look at too closely. And then they come out and are in healthy shape again. Um, this, of course, remains uh, a fantasy, but one can hope. So if we look back at the five questions we started with, first of all, we don't know what aging is, but we can define it functionally as a balance of robustness and frailty uh, using the utility of this idea of reserve. Um, we can begin to have markers that are measuring aging, Again, they're not looking at the causal factors. It's a quote from the uh, famous French book, uh, The Little Prince, where the critical uh, matter is, not, is invisible for our eyes. Um, how much is human aging affected by genetic variation? Well, by the rate of aging analysis, uh, up to nearly half. So there's a substantial component that affects uh, certainly health span. Aging can be defined as contributing to longevity and disease. Nevertheless, it's different because it's there independent of when we die and whether or not we've reached a disease state. And can we modify aging? Well, we know some ways that we could do something about it, and perhaps we can be more active on the epidemiological front while we await the fountain of youth. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good. Thank you for a uh, beautiful presentation, wonderful lecture. Thank you. And, uh, my name is Toshio Hamatani from Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. The reason why I, was he I, I'm, I am here now is uh, likely that uh, I was in Laboratory of Genetics uh, in National Institute on Aging in Baltimore uh, actually 15 years ago. And uh, I studied uh, global uh, gene expression profiling of uh, pre implantation embryos and uh, Dr. Minoru Ko's supervision. And at that time, uh, the David is uh, uh, the chair of laboratory of genetics. And uh, actually, I 
they are very, very much good teachers. And uh, I, I actually learned the basic of uh, uh, medical research uh, from uh, bo both, of both teachers. So I have been uh, looking forward to having a lecture and seeing him. Uh, so I have, we have uh, three, 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 uh, 30, 30, 30 minutes. I think uh, I would like to have a comment or a, a question from the floor. So anyone, please. Especially the young. <laughs> So uh, very interesting. So if you take the brain, what would you consider as a reserve? Is it the neuron or the neural stem cell? Well, you, I mean, I'm not a uh, neurobiologist. I think it would be up to the neurobiologist to define it. Certainly, there's massive loss of neurons. And you know that it's increased by alcohol consumption and so on. That would be enough to define reserve. Um, after all, the stem cells are really quite limited in their location and in the number of types of brain uh, sections as th that they serve, as far as I know. I don't think there are stem cells for most parts of the brain. So it would be loss, probably, of neurons. Um, so you mentioned something about, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, some Italian, um, the, 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 I don't know, composer or uh, whatever, producer. He produced yes. these uh, best works at 81 years, yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, what do you think is the reason? I mean, is Well, he started out with a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> he must have had a very large reserve. No, I think the, I mean, you're closer to this than I am. What I hear is that we never use more than half of our brain function and so on. So obviously there's enough reserve for him to continue functioning. I suppose that if you're working in a particular field and you're creative in that field, experience also counts. Verdi knew how to pick a melody, uh, for example, which could provide a large part of the structure of an aria or of an act. And he always talked about the fact that he had learned how to twist it so that it could be used in different ways. So. Um, uh, what you know in, in old age certainly is different and in some ways greater than what you knew when you were young, and that may help. Thank you. Experience can count. Thank you for a great talk. And uh, I'm interested in the FOX3 function. Uh, is that molecule have the relation uh, to the uh, mitochondrial energy generation or the expression of the sartrine or something? It's a very good question. The, the uh, FOXO3 is not an unknown molecule in the aging field. Some people have claimed that they see FOXO3 uh, variants affecting uh, uh, longevity, but it's been hard to reproduce. For example, we haven't seen it in Sardinia and neither has the Super Centenarian project here. Nevertheless, it's part of the uh, AKT uh, pathway, so it's deeply involved in metabolism, and it will affect energetics and many other things. Um, so it's not clear. It's not clear uh, the extent to which it, it's not clear what the mechanism is by which it's uh, maintaining the oocytes either. Uh, every every result leads to more questions for research. <laughs> David, David, yes, uh, how about how about uh, uh, the aging in kidney, uh, the function of kidney uh, in knockout FOXO3? I'm sorry, the function, the the, the uh, kidney. How about kidney? Another uh, organs? Oh, um, in knockout mass of FOXO3. I think it's present in all the organs, so it could have an effect. Um, and it certainly hasn't been looked at. The, uh, it's just not known. I mean, these are just initial observations, and it would have to be looked at specifically. The, Thank you. Uh, very e exciting uh, lecture. Thank you very much. 
And uh, you said that 40% of aging is inherited genetic control. Mm -hmm. So that they also, you said the causal mechanism is not known. But you also mentioned the uh, correlated with DNA methylation. So, yes. So you have an idea of the speculation of well, how genetic disorder programming uh, aging process? Well, I'm a geneticist, so I'm agnostic. And I'm actually interested in what we'll see with the uh, uh, GWAS in this case. My guess is that we'll get a hint of uh, which processes are involved. Um, and that might be a way to get at it. The, uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's usually a mistake to speculate in public. <laughs> <laughs> it was simply DNA maturation probably down, uh, uh, well, it's, regulate uh, Fox, Fox for something or something. Well, it's clear that DNA methylation is affecting the transcription yeah. profile yeah. and probably shutting down genes that are important. But the question is, what's causing the DNA methylation? Uh, it's not so simple. And that's simply unknown. Uh, it could be that there's a basic effect on chromatin structure. It could be that it really is telomeres which are shortening and that causes a change in the metabolism. All of the theories are plausible, and they may all contribute. You know, it could be the blind man and the elephant in this case. When you predict uh, uh, aging, uh, that case is uh, you, you see the difference among organs and also difference between sexes. That's in the methylation rate. Yeah. For us, we get a single value, which seems to cut across different uh, organs and, and uh, oh. processes. So um, I think the, the easiest view of that is that there's some fundamental process that's affecting everything, and then tissue-specific effects that accelerate the process in those mm -hmm. tissues. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there's two parts to it, in other mm -hmm. words. The other hand, uh, aging related to non-genetic, you uh -huh. have an idea what kind of uh, environmental factors or extrinsic factor is mostly causing age, like inflammation, stress, something like that. You have an idea? Again, there are many, many, yeah. many hypotheses. I yeah. think the, if you think of it in terms of health span, yeah. uh, the results are, are very clear in many studies that diet and exercise are critical and that you can bring back people, uh, you can get people who have been uh, diagnosed as disabled in a, in a home for the elderly back to moving around and doing things. So yes, it does work. Um, but again, it's very hard to get people to change their habits. Um, and if it happens, it's usually detrimental, like introducing McDonald's into Japan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your educational lecture. I'm Kei Miyakoshi. I'm uh, actually a colleague of Toshio. Uh -huh. um, actually, I major in uh, fetal medicine. So my question is about placental aging. As you know, the period or uh, interval from conception to parturition depends on the species. Actually, 42 weeks of pregnancy. Uh -huh. After 42 uh, weeks of pregnancy, placenta decreases its function. Do you have any idea? I think you're the expert on that. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, you could probably give a better answer than I can. The, uh, I mean, the, the, the question of when aging starts remains, and my guess is it would be unstable before puberty. That something about that time really uh, sets in, but that's just a guess. We don't have any measurements on people before that. We certainly don't have it on, on the early embryo or anything like that. We have seen some correlations of, uh, of traits, for example, uh, the size of the kidney, for example, is simply related to weight at birth. So yes, there are going to be uh, fetal uh, processes that are critical, but exactly what the relation is, is uh, it's early times. Thank you so much.
Oh my gosh, more. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. So I, we have also interest for the DNA, DNA methylation. So, but we have only the blood uh, samples. So the blood sample contains a lot of the various cells uh, uh, in the, uh, so it's difficult to analyze. So my question uh, is, so, uh, so age-dependent methylation uh, is occurred in randomly in the, uh, in the CPG island or selectively uh, occurred in the the, uh, that's discussed to some extent by Horvath. He picked these 353 sites because they each tended to show some age signal. And then he got a composite. In a sense, he's using 353 methylation points in the genome like the other method uses 50 traits. It's a composite that he gets. Um, he does look at different organs. Again, it's an overall value, uh, but he has from the ENCODE project and other projects, there are lots of different uh, samples that have been saved. You know the ages, and so you do have a lot of organs that you can look at, even though it's a small sample. So that's how he defines the aging rate in the different uh, organs. Um, it's certainly not pushed to individual cell types at this point. Um, but it could be. I mean, there's no, there's no technological limit to this. Uh, if you had uh, uh, extra kidneys from uh, surgery or operations and you did single cell sequencing on people of different ages, yes, you would begin to see whether there is a difference between cell types, uh, which, whether there are different methylation sites that are active and so on. David, thank you for your great talk. So I'm interested in the oocyte aging. And as you displayed today, the Fox, FOXL2 show, uh, and the transgenic mice of FOXL2 showed more follicles, and also transgenic of FOX3 showed 40% uh, greater, greater fertility than mm -hmm. quantity. So my question is, the, uh, the reason why the aged women show the, uh, less Fertility is not because only uh, not only because mm -hmm. of the follicle depletion, depletion, but also the oocyte aging, the yes, cortis yes. De decline. So my question is that uh, can the FOXL2 and or FOXL3 can uh, <coughs> restore the oocyte quali quality during aging? It's a good question. The, uh, the, 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 the reference is to the fact that 10 years before menopause, the oocyte quality begins to go down, as unfortunately uh, we know too well. The, uh, it could be, I guess, that the follicle, the, the point is that the follicles that are being made are at least as good as the others. So they may also be aging at the same rate, but there are more of them, so there's still more fertility. That's the simple fact, but, but to be honest, we haven't looked. My guess is, uh, from limited data that we've, ha that we've had or that I've seen in the literature, that there is the accumulation of DNA damage, and that probably is directly related. I don't know whether that would be counteracted by FOXO3. We simply haven't looked. Okay. Yes, Venora. If it's quick, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think uh, related to that question, that um, so so my understanding is basically those two genes, transgenes, you know, uh, overexpression of the uh, uh, those two genes basically increase the reserve. Yes. So yeah. uh, the the after birth, that for example, um, maybe you can make. Uh, uh, time-dependent uh, transgenic line that, for example, later mm -hmm. at, during uh, yes, adulthood, that's true. just increase those dose would not help? Or you, do you think it may help? don't know. I don't know. It's a, a possible experiment to see. The, uh, uh, incidentally, uh, uh, I, the, the, the FOXO3 in the mice is actually replaced by a very similar gene in human. It's not exactly the same gene. I think it's a different fox gene, but it's very mm -hmm. close mm -hmm. to the same one. 
but uh, it's possible. Uh, I've been reluctant to do experiments of that type because remember the actual transgene is modified at the phosphorylation sites, so it doesn't work quite as well. It tends to, if you put it into the background of a FOXO3 knockout mouse, so it's the only source of FOXO3, you do see follicles. We haven't yet tried to see if we can uh, mate those animals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, a time-dependent turn on of the transgene might be complicated by that. But I think uh, the, if that's really simply just to increase the, uh, you know, increasing the reserve, and then of course the people who are already maybe 30, 40s, there's no hope. But uh, if you can just add those you know, yeah. transgene or whatever the overexpression later at this uh, well, again, life, if, and then if, there's in, some hope for everybody. In theory, to, if you could have an agonist for FOXO3, you might get, have maintenance right. that would improve. Yeah. The, uh, and I guess that could actually be looked for right. uh, chemically, mm -hmm. at least in mice. Mm -hmm. um, well, I actually, I have one more question. Yes, sir. <laughs> so related to uh, DNA methylation issues that this, so basically Hobart's, uh, the idea is that DNA methylation is going up, right? Am I correct? Yes, yeah. So it's sort of uh, opposite of the, uh, I think some traditional idea like uh, Bruce Katanak and other people looking at X chromosome inactivation. Yeah. And when the animals or Which the people get gets older, lost, yeah. lost and then, X chromosome inactivation is basically relaxed. Yeah. So in that case, the people thought that methylation is uh, randomly gone, and then that's, you know, so, so it's, it's a kind of opposite, I think. So could you? My, my bet is, though I haven't, I haven't looked at any of the data, I don't know whether it's been specified, there are probably many sites that are lost and many that are gained. Okay. And he picked the ones that showed the uh, changes that he was looking for. Okay. The okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Is there any question? It's getting late. Yeah. So it's time. I think it's time to close. So <laughs> in closing, uh, uh, actually, I, I, I very much. I, I would like to. I would like David uh, to keep. Uh, supporting the relationship between KU University and the NIH in future uh, continuously, please. And uh, thank you very much to, to today. Thank you. Thank, thank you for all the, the audience, contribution of the audience. <laughs>